Okay, physiology, welcome to chapter 12, cardiovascular physiology. We begin in our first section of our chapter with an overview of the components of the circulatory system. The primary components are obviously the heart, blood vessels, and then of course blood. And then if we look at blood um, itself, we see that blood is composed of, of some uh, different, um, different elements. Blood is essentially a series of cells or fractions of cells that float around, float around in a liquid referred to as plasma. Um, we'll talk about the components of plasma a little later in our discussion. But the first thing we want to talk about uh, at this particular point in time are those items that float around in that plasma. The items are referred to as formed elements. We avoid the word cell in this particular case because one of these elements, a platelet, is less than a cell. It's formed from one cell, of course, that fractures into a number of smaller pieces. But if we look at those formed elements, what we see is that we have three types. We have leukocytes, of course, the various types of white, white blood cells. We have platelets involved in blood clotting, uh, formed from a megakaryocyte that fractures in, into a number of very small uh, pieces. And then we have urethrocytes, but uh, which are red blood cells. But by far, the most common formed element uh, is the urethrocyte. 99% of the formed elements are urethrocytes. If we take blood uh, and place it in a centrifuge and spin it at a relatively low velocity for uh, 10 minutes, then what we end up with is the uh, formed elements uh, packed down to the bottom of the tube and the plasma ends up uh, on the top. The formed elements are heavier, so they, they uh, pellet uh, down to the form a pellet uh, more ra uh, first. So the, what we'll notice is that the urethrocytes end up on the bottom, and then on top of the urethrocytes, we have this little layer referred to as a buffy coat that consists of the leukocytes and the platelets, and the urethrocytes overall make up 45 to 42% or so, depending on if we're male or female, of uh, the overall volume of the blood, 45% in men and 42% in women. If we look at the components of the actual uh, circulatory uh, system, in other words, the vessels and the heart, then what we notice is this that we are mammals, and as mammals, we have a fully separated, very efficient, by the way, circulatory system that consists of two separate loops. Um, we have a pump uh, that's, lo that's the key to uh, pushing blood uh, through this uh, system, and the, the pump there is the heart. The heart's divided into two chambers on top, referred to as atria, and two chambers on the bottom, referred to as ventricles. If we follow the flow of blood, let's start in the left ventricle. The left ventricle sends blood uh, to so-called systemic circulation. In other words, it sends blood to all the different organs in the body except the lungs. And so when the heart, uh, when the left ventricle contracts, then blood exits the left ventricle, making its way into the aorta, which is the largest and thickest walled uh, vessel found, blood vessel found in the body. And then that blood makes its way to systemic uh, arteries. The systemic arteries branch into smaller and smaller branches, making their way eventually to uh, systemic capillaries. And so these are the systemic capillaries. And systemic capillaries are found all over the body. In fact, every single cell in the body is within two or three cell widths of a capillary, no matter where that, that cell is located. It is in the capillaries that the exchange of all materials takes place. The, the exchange of gases and the exchange of nutrients and wastes takes place. And so that, of course, is the whole point of the circulatory system. We see that oxygen is lost, and we can see that in this diagram as we go from red uh, blood, representing oxygenated blood, to blue blood, representing deoxygenated blood. The deoxygenated blood makes its way into venules first, which are illustrated here, which are larger than capillaries, but still smaller than veins and fairly thin-walled. Then the blood makes its way into veins. Veins, of course, are very thin-walled relative to arteries. And then all of these veins uh, empty into uh, two uh, veins, the inferior and superior vena cava, which are actually not shown here separately. 
That blood, of course, goes back to the right atrium, and then that uh, blood goes to the right ventricle. The ventricles are pumps. Um, the atria, they do move blood, um, but they move it very uh, weakly. They're very thin-walled, and they provide just a little bit of push at the end to get the, the blood from the atria into the ventricle. In fact, if the atria stop contracting, you can survive without atrial contraction. However, you can't survive, obviously, without ventricular contraction. On the right-hand side of the heart, the walls of the ventricle are a little bit thinner, uh, representing uh, the fact that blood doesn't have to be pumped as far or as powerfully in so-called pul pulmonary circulation. And so all this blue blood, which represents deoxygenated blood, leaves the right ventricle in the pulmonary trunk, makes its way to the pulmonary arteries. Those pulmonary arteries branch into pulmonary capillaries in the lungs. Just the opposite is happening here as compared to what happened in systemic capillaries. We're going from deoxygenated blood to oxygenated blood. We're now in pulmonary veins. And so pulmonary veins, of course, do contain oxygenated blood. That blood goes back to the left atrium and then to the left ventricle, and we've completed our trip through the circulatory system. One thing to note in this particular, uh, at this particular point in our discussion is that we can determine whether a vessel is an artery or a vein based on which direction the blood is moving. If the blood is moving away from the heart, it's an artery. If it's moving towards the heart, then it's a vein. So arteries in the pulmonary circulation do carry deoxygenated blood and veins do carry oxygenated blood. Um, but nonetheless, they are, in every sense of the word, arteries and veins. Arteries and veins are different anatomically, and therefore they play a different physiological role, as we will uh, see. The, the basic idea is that arteries are much thicker and more elastic than our veins, which have lots of smooth muscle uh, but have much thinner walls because the pressure is much lower in uh, veins as opposed to arteries. Lastly, although it's not pictured on this slide, we want to mention a portal system. And so you remember from chapter 11 that a portal system occurs when you leave the heart and you go through one capillary bed, and then you go through some portal vessels, sometimes referred to as portal veins, to a second capillary bed, and then you make your way back to the heart. So the key is in a portal system, you have two capillary beds that you go to before you go back to the heart. We find portal systems in two places in human physiology. One is the portal system that we find between the hypothalamus and the, and the anterior pituitary. The second is the portal system that we find uh, in the digestive system, and so the hepatic portal system. All the, the blood goes through a series of capillaries um, that uh, surround the digestive system, primarily the small intestine. All of that blood goes through portal vessels to the liver, and of course this is adaptive because in the liver, anything that happened to be toxic that was uh, picked up in digestion can be removed before that blood makes its way back to the heart and then into general circulation. In the case of the circulatory system, what we notice is that fluid, blood in this case, moves in the circulatory system as a result of differences in pressure. We refer to the study of the movement of fluids as hemodynamics. And hemodynamics investigates the relationship between blood pressure flow and then resistance to flow. Blood movement, which is measured in liters per minute, is a result of the differences in pressure between, the difference in pressure between two different locations. Um, and so it's only a relative difference, not an absolute difference. Uh, so what we notice is that in this diagram, we see an illustration of this. The pressure at one is 100 millimeters of mercury. The pressure at 2 is 10 millimeters of mercury, and so the uh, difference between those is 90 millimeters of mercury, and the flow is 10 milliliters per minute as a result of that. So the pressure here is higher, and the pressure here is lower, so the blood is flowing in this direction, or whatever the liquid is, is flowing in that direction. Here, the pressure at 1 is 500, the pressure at 2 is 410. Again, there's a difference of 90, and in the same direction, so the flow rate is exactly the same illustrating the point that differences in pressure are relative, not absolute. And that's what's responsible for the movement of fluid in the circulatory system. Let's also note this, that we measure all of the pressures in the circulatory system in millimeters of mercury uh, because of the tradition of measuring pressure um, with a barometer 
um, that uh, allows mercury to be pushed up this column. And so millimeters of mercury will be the, the unit of pressure that we use throughout our discussion. What we notice is that knowing the pressure difference between two points is not enough in and of itself to calculate the flow from point A to point B through a tube. In order to calculate that, you also need to know the resistance. Resistance is a measure of the friction that slows down the flow of the liquid through that tube. So flow is, is directly proportional to the change in pressure, as we see here in this equation, but it's inversely proportional to the resistance. Obviously, resistance slows flow. So we are very interested in the circulatory system, then, in knowing what determines that resistance, what slows flow in the circulatory system. This is going to be important because the circulatory system at different times is going to want to slow the flow of blood to certain areas of the body and at other times increase the flow of blood to other areas of the body. And so it's, it's very important that we understand how the body does that. So resistance then is determined by four factors. It's determined by viscosity. And as it turns out, the viscosity of the blood can vary a little bit, um, but it doesn't vary tremendously. In extreme dehydration, the viscosity does increase and that can cause severe problems physiologically. But in normal physiology, the viscosity of the blood remains constant. The next uh, f factor that determines resistance is length, the overall length of the blood vessels. Now, the, and the length of the blood vessels um, is not going to change uh, in this particular case, so we don't have to worry much about uh, length. Let's see, going out of order here, um, the next determinant of resistance is a constant, 8 over pi. That, of course, is not going to change. And so we're left with this one final factor, radius. And so as it turns out, radius, as we see in this next bullet point, is the, by far the most important determinant of resistance, in the case, at least, of our circulatory system. Because none of these other factors change, um, but the radius of blood vessels can change. And so as uh, what we notice is that resistance is inversely proportional to the radius. As the radius gets bigger, resistance goes down. As the radius gets smaller, resistance goes up. So resistance is roughly equal to 1 over the radius squared. 1 over the, the radius uh, squared. By far, that's the most important determinant of resistance in the circulatory system. That's illustrated in figure 12.5 over here at the right-hand side of our screen. We have two tubes, uh, two tubes that illustrate uh, the blood vessels. So the radius of the first tube is 2, the radius of the second tube is 1. We have this reservoir of water between the tubes, and we have the uh, tube on the, the left-hand side here on the left. We have the tube uh, on the uh, right-hand side over here on the right. So radius of 2 for A, radius of, of 1 for B. And down here we see that the resistance of A is roughly equal to 1 over the radius uh, raised to the fourth power. And so that uh, equates to 1 over 2 in this particular case, which is the radius, to the fourth power, which is 1 over 16. 1 over 16. So that's the resistance on the left hand side. On the right hand side, we see that the same thing occurs, and resistance then is equal to uh, 1 over 1 raised to the fourth power, and so the resistance on the right-hand side is 1. This means that if we calculate the flow, what we see is that flow is calculated as the change in pressure over the resistance. And so here we notice this, that the resistance in B is 16 times the resistance in A based on the diameter of the, the tubes on either side. So this means that the flow in B is 1 16th the flow that we observe in A. So we've decreased the uh, radius in this particular uh, case. We've cut the, the, si the size of the tube in half, but we've decreased the flow 16-fold. And so this is a perfect illustration of, a very nice illustration of what happens in the circulatory system. Even relatively small changes in blood vessels have a very dramatic impact on the flow of blood that's moving through them. This allows the body to very effectively regulate how much blood goes to various organs in the body by adjusting the size of blood vessels.
If we look at the anatomy of the heart, starting at the outside, what we notice is that we have this tough fibrous sac that surrounds the entire heart, known as the pericardium. Um, just below that, if I'm trying to point here with the cursor there, we have this space referred to as the pericardial space filled with pericardial fluid. And then on the surface of the heart itself, we have a very thin uh, layer referred to as epicardium. And so the purposes of these layers are as follows, as you likely remember from anatomy. As the heart contracts, it changes shape. That change in shape is prevented from becoming too drastic as a result of the pericardium, which constrains the shape of the heart to, to uh, some degree. And the epicardium allows the pericardium to slide back and forth against the surface of the heart as that contraction occurs without any friction occurring whatsoever. If we make our way into the heart itself, we see that the walls of the heart are composed of uh, cardiac muscle referred to as myocardium. And then if we look on the inside of the chambers of the heart, both the atria and the ventricles, as well as all the blood vessels in the body, we see a, a very thin uh, layer known as endothelium. And so the blood vessels are actually, blood cells, excuse me, are actually protected from the blood kept separate from the blood by this very thin endothelial layer that is continuous throughout the circulatory system. As we mentioned previously, uh, the, there are four chambers in the heart. There are two chambers uh, located close to the top of the heart, uh, referred to as the left atrium and the right atrium. And there are two thicker wall chambers located in the, the lower portion of the heart, referred to as the right ventricle and the left ventricle. Remember, from your anatomy days that as you look at the heart you are looking at the heart in the anatomical position so the right ventricle appears on the left and the left ventricle appears on the right because of course the anatomical position is a person standing facing you and so all these structures are shown in that anatomical position we also have some valves four valves located in the heart um, the first valves that we want to mention are the atrioventricular valves uh, shown here on the right side the right atrioventricular valve is also known as the tricuspid valve the tricuspid valve is so named because it has three cusps that uh, form it as we look at the left side of the heart we see that we have the left atrioventricular valve, also known as the bicuspid valve or the mitral valve as a result of, of the similar appearance to the Pope's hat, apparently. And so these valves, the purpose of these valves is to prevent the backflow of blood from the ventricle back up into the atria, prevent the backflow of blood from, in this case, the right ventricle into the right atrium. The other valves that we have here are known as the semilunar valves. This is the pulmonary semilunar valve, and so the pulmonary semilunar valve prevents backflow of blood from the pulmonary trunk into the right atrium. This is the aortic semilunar valve. The aortic semilunar valve prevents the backflow of blood from the, the aorta into the left ventricle. As we look at these valves in more detail, what we notice is that uh, the valves open and close as a result of passive processes. It's entirely the result of the difference in pressures that are found in different parts of the heart. There's no, there are no muscles attached to these valves that ca actively cause these valves to open or close. Now, a couple pictures will be useful to us at this particular point in time. Here, we're looking at the heart uh, from above, and as you can see in section A here, the heart has been sectioned and the atria have been removed. And so we're looking uh, down at the left atrioventricular or bicuspid valve, the right atrioventricular or tricuspid valve, and then the semilunar valves. Um, over here, we see the uh, semilunar valves, uh, one of the semilunar valves, and so this semilunar valve is open, and then this semilunar valve is nearly completely closed. The atrioventricular valves consist of these sheets of tissue that are pushed backwards and they're prevented from turning completely inside out as a result of the fact that there are these little cords, similar to the cords on a parachute, that are attached to the valves. The cords are referred to as chordae tendinae, and these cords are attached to papillary muscles. And so when the ventricles contract, the papillary muscles contract, and they pull on these cords, preventing the, the prolapse uh, or the, the valves from turning inside out, allowing the flow of blood from the ventricles back up into the atria.
Now the semilunar valves are different. Uh, they are hinged, as if I can point here, 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 and here. And so when the pressure in the ventricle exceeds the pressure, for instance, here in the, eighth, in the aorta, then the valve opens. And then when the pressure decreases in the ventricle, dropping below that found in the, the aorta, these valves snap shut, preventing the flow of blood from the aorta back there into the ventricle. Uh, the same thing in, applies in, in exactly the same manner for the pulmonary semilunar valve. It's just we're talking about the right ventricle in that particular case. Lastly, uh, we want to talk briefly about the muscle of the heart and the conducting system of the heart. So the cardiac muscle that's not de depicted here, the cardiac muscle itself is arranged into layers that encircle the, the chambers, in the case of the ventricles and the atria. And so when that muscle contracts, it exerts pressure much like cl the clenching of a fist. And so it decreases the volume of that chamber and increases the pressure as a result of that. So the fluid moves as a result of that increase in pressure. We use the term syncytium to refer to a number of muscle cells that are all connected together. In the case of cardiac muscle cells, they're connected via gap junctions, and so they act in unison. So this means that the atria of the heart in a process, in a, in a manner that we'll examine in more detail moving forward here, all the cells of the atria of the heart act together. They're all connected via these gap junctions. So an action potential causes all of the cardiac muscle cells of the atria con to contract. And then the cells of the atria are separated via the fibrous skeleton of the heart, which serves as electrical insulation between the atrial cells and the ventricular cells. So in order for the, that action potential to get from the atrial cells down to, to the ventricular cells, the heart has to make use of, of something referred to as the conducting system of the heart. The conducting system of the heart uh, begins with the sinoatrial node and then includes a, num a number of additional components that we'll be talking about in uh, future chapters. And it eventually delivers that action potential that was initiated in the um, atria and delivers it to all the cardiac muscle uh, cells. So the take-home message here is that as far as syncytiums go, all the atrial cells and all the ventricular cells are connected together, but the atrial cells are not connected, connected to the ventricular cells. But for an action potential to get from the atria to the ventricular cells, it has to make use of the conducting system of the heart that penetrates that fibrous skeleton of the heart. If we look at innervation of the heart, what we see is this, that the heart is autorhythmic, so it doesn't depend on the central nervous system in order to beat, the, rather the action potentials originate in the SA node, but rather there are nerves that terminate on the heart from the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system that have an impact on the overall, uh, both the speed and the power of the, the contraction um, of the heart itself. So what we see is that we have sympathetic nerves that terminate on both the atria and the ventricles, uh, shown here on the right-hand side of our diagram. They're releasing norepinephrine, which binds to beta-adrenergic -adren receptors. Epinephrine, released from the adrenal medulla, also binds to these same receptors, and so that both speeds up the, the uh, beat of the heart and it increases the stroke volume of the heart. If we look over at the right-hand side, we see that the parasympathetic uh, nerves also contribute to the innervation of the heart via the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve terminates on the atria, releasing acetylcholine, as you know, because you know about Otto Louis experiment, and that acetylcholine obviously binds to muscarinic receptors, which have an overall uh, opposite impact uh, that slows down the beat of the heart and decreases the stroke volume. So uh, the heart is not, the, the beating of the heart is not initiated by the nervous system, but rather it is regulated by the sympathetic and parasympathetic inputs. Lastly, the blood supply of the heart. So it may be surprising to realize that the heart doesn't extract any oxygen from the blood that flows through it directly, but rather what we see is when the blood exits uh, via from the, the left ventricle to the aorta, 
there are coronary arteries that immediately branch off. That's the very first arteries that branch off the oxygenated blood leaving the heart. And those coronary arteries branch out and spread out over all of the heart, providing a rich supply of oxygen uh, to the heart. So the blood, the heart, it relies entirely on those coronary arteries for its supply of blood and therefore oxygen.